Mobile photography is changing every aspect of the photo world for both amateurs and pros. Today, we're gonna take a look at how tech is influencing what happens behind the shot. Hi, welcome back to the Behind the Shot podcast. My name is Steve Brazel. I am your host. I appreciate your joining us. I've got a great show lined up for you today. A couple things to uh, just let you know about housekeeping wise. First of all, we have moved from the This Week in Photo uh, network and, and website. We've moved to BehindTheShot.tv. So if you're going to go leave a review or subscribe to the podcast, make sure you do it through the new links because the old show is still up. Want to make sure that you get the right feed in the show that as, as it continues. Other than that, if you ever want to reach out to me, I'll give my social media links coming up a little bit later. But today, I've got a guest I've wanted to have on for quite a long time. Uh, an avid photographer, amateur photographer, hobbyist, you might call it. But what I consider to be one of the top people around, especially in the podcasting world, but one of the top people around as far as tech news and tech journalism is concerned. So Andy Anatko, welcome to the show. Welcome. Thanks a lot for the kind words, Steve. Oh, well, kind words. We've met once in person, and I, I told you then, but let me just kind of give for the people that are viewing that don't watch tech podcasts. I originally found out about you through Mac Break Weekly, which is a, a podcast done on Leo Laporte's This Week in Tech Network. And you're on there with Renee Ritchie, uh, quite often Alex Lindsay, Leo himself, and then yourself. I've been watching that show forever. And even though I do a photography podcast, I'm not ashamed to say if I've got nine podcasts lined up in my feed, Mac Break Weekly is always the first one to be watched. <laughs> um, cool. So... You are an avid podcaster. Give us an idea of some of the other stuff you do. You do Mac Break Weekly, but you do a lot of stuff. Yeah, um, I have to just say I'm a tech journalist because whereas 10 or 15 years ago, that meant you have a newspaper column or you have a, or you have a magazine column. Now it just means that you stay awake uh, and stay aware of pretty much everything. And then you, I have about four or five different kinds of media uh, that uh, I practice my craft in, so I still I still do uh, I still consider myself mostly a writer, but I do lots and lots of podcasting. I do uh, uh, public radio in Boston for about a half hour on tech, about once every week or once every couple of weeks on WPBH. You're right, the the Boston public radio station. I got it. Can I get that online? Can you listen to that over the web? Yep. If you go to wgbh.org or wgbhnews.org, uh, you can stream pretty much stream it live, or you can just uh, they have I think the last couple of weeks worth of broadcasts just stacked up there. And you can always because I see your I see your tweets when you're walking in with your if you had notes on on the iPad <laughs> stuff. So and we'll give out Andy's uh, and Andy's social media stuff. But along with Mac Break Weekly, you do uh, a podcast periodically with Jason Snell. Yep. Occasionally, he invites me to be in his <laughs> one of his eight hundred different uh, incomparable podcasts. So yes. Okay. And material podcast still going? Yep. That's uh, our weekly show with uh, Florence Ion uh, about uh, basically Google and Android and all things Google. So the whole world, basically, of Google. What about Pretty. whatever happened to uh, Anako's Al Almanac? Well, uh, I was doing that on Five by Five for uh, a number of years. Uh, we stopped doing it on 5x5. Five five. I wanted to relaunch it uh, on Relay.fm after 5x5 five five decided they didn't want to keep doing it. Uh, and unfortunately, it just kind of got... It's, I, I've been doing it for like three years as like two people, as a duo. And it was hard to figure out how to produce it as a one-man show and making sure I wasn't duplicating stuff right. that other people were doing. I, I really tried... It's both intellectually more interesting to me and also if, if I feel as though I'm doing something that's kind of unique and kind of special, but it's also uh, having respect for people's time. It's like I, the one thing I really didn't want to be is, oh, oh, good, another white guy is going to talk about technology on podcasts. We needed more. We, we needed more white oh, guy let's get one more of those. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so, so uh, I, I'm hoping I'll still bring it back. Uh, sometime as soon as that, as soon as I really crack that, I enjoyed uh, so I that post podcast. And you mentioned you mentioned Relay FM, which um, for those people in photography, a lot of photographers listen to photography based podcasts, and they don't really venture out into other worlds. Relay FM is a great network; they got some great stuff. Yeah, I'm really so impressed with uh, what Mike has set up in just a short amount of time. It's there's such a big gulf between. Uh, the, the great power and the great democratic nature of anybody being able to launch a podcast 
and somebody launching a podcast network where every single show is professionally done and very much worth listening to. So every single show may not be your cup of tea, but you can't say that the people who are involved in it, from the guy who, from the people who run the network to the people who are doing the shows themselves, don't think of that half hour or that hour or that hour and a half as a really important thing that they're trying to create and not waste anybody's time. Yeah, I kind of think of it actually as kind of the um, the cheesecake factory menu of podcasting, right? It's so large <laughs> and there's such a wide variety of, of topics and things that you might want to listen to. And I, I really would suggest to anybody that's watching that's really into the photography space, go check out some of the tech podcasts that are out there and you'd be surprised. Whatever your other hobbies are, you'll end up it's like now now it's a commercial for podcasting in general. So here's the thing. I, we should mention also formerly the uh, the columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times. Yep. I and, was their tech columnist from about 1999 until just a few months ago. Okay. And uh, one of my favorite review people, actually, by the way, there's, there's, there's something about you, the way that you write. And I've, I've kind of wanted to ask you about how, how this goes kind of formed itself in your writing style but when when you write you write very much like you speak and you manage to drop in comic references and tech references and and sci-fi references and movie references or a cartoon re i mean your your ability to on the fly pull up a, a really good analogy when you're when you're trying to relate tech to the real person D did that just come to you or does that do you understand what I mean? Was that a natural yeah. thing to you? I, I guess it was, well, I, it, it comes out of my writing voice, I think, because uh, when I started writing and I got my first like magazine column when I was like 19 years old in college, um, I thought that uh, if I'm lucky, it'll last a year. <laughs> then after a year, it kept on going. I realized that now would be a good time to form a long range plan to make sure to, to see if I keep getting to do this thing I really like doing for as long as I want to do it. And I was uh, impacted in both directions by uh, by uh, other columnists and other writers. I thought there was a lot of, uh, there, there was a lot of tech writing that seemed to be, uh, been, it seems to be a lecture from a very, very high spot of ground that this is a club that you're not supposed to be able to join if you don't under if you've never hand rolled an XML file then I, I don't it don't leave it to me to ex explain to you what XML is because you're right. supposed to already know that uh, I it's I go I, I come from a place of not expecting people to know what I'm talking about not expecting people to believe what I'm telling them uh, and also not expecting them to understand why I think this thing I want to tell them about is important enough for me to want to tell them about it. Uh, so that was a big formative influence, but the other, but the biggest individual influence was certainly Roger Ebert and his film reviews, uh, because I just realized that I, I read his reviews, every single one of them, whether I was interested in the movie or not, because he just communicated and wrote so well. And he, he didn't, I, again, the phrase, he's not wasting anybody's time. He's not, if he introduces a story about his, his working life, or about his life or experience he had, it's not because he's trying to fill word count. It's not because he thinks he's more important than the movie he's, he's reviewing. It's because he's trying to share the experience that he brings to watching this movie, that this is, these are the eyes that I'm looking through, and you may not see it the same way as I do, but here's how you understand how I look at movies. And every single one of them is eminently readable. And so not only did I think very correctly that he's uh, very much worth emulating, but also I realized that uh, if you can trick people into reading <laughs> your stuff, whether they're interested in it or not, that means that if your goal is to get people to understand uh, why the attack on Section 230 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is a really, really scary thing, if it actually goes through, they'll see, oh, God, did Section 230 right. of blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there's, there's got to be something else. But if they're like, okay, I, I've enjoyed the stuff that Andy Notko has written, I'll just read it just for the just to get because I'm sure it'll be entertaining or interesting. And then I kind of trick them into thinking, oh, wow, you mean that it might be impossible for me to post photos <laughs> on a blog or on Instagram because of this all this all this wonderfulness of the of the web is because of Section 230 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Oh, I'm glad I know that now. So, well, yeah. and and when you when you when you bring a, a reader when you get a reader that becomes a fan of your writing style regardless of subject 
it gives you license to introduce to them things that, as a writer that you think they need to know or that you want to say and know that they'll be there to, to at least try and absorb some of it. It's an interesting analogy to, to Mr. Ebert, who I understand you knew and, and were friends with, um, because I kind of felt the same way. Roger Ebert, when he would write, or even just when he did his television stuff, he had a way of not wasting words. There were no rabbit holes in his sentences. If he, if he said something, it was going somewhere, you know, and you kind of wanted to take that ride with yeah. him to see what his point was going to be at the end. <laughs> and that's kind of what your writing does to me, which brings us to the main reason that I have you on, aside from the fact that you're a photographer, <clears throat> you're an amazing tech journalist, but you're the only guy I know of that walks around and, and posts that you've got five phones on you so that you can go <laughs> test cameras. And you have certain places you normally go, Boston Public Library, um, the Public Gardens, places like that. When you walk out, I had stuff I was going to ask and something just popped in my head. When you walk out with five phones and you're going to test them in the library or in the park, what's your, what's your goal? I mean, are you, are you trying to trip up a camera? Are you trying to, to take pictures that you can then look at later and, and really set them up for the weak spots or you want to see where they naturally win or fail on their own? What are you looking for in that? In other words, well, uh, in the early days, it was really to spot the failures of each individual phone, and each individual phone would have multiple failures to them. Uh, and the only way to really appreciate what each one of these things would do, whatever new phone, whatever new camera would come out, is to take the same kinds of pictures over and over again, uh, including pictures that I've taken with like $2,000, $3,000 cameras, because you, I, I've taken certain pictures inside the Boston Public Library and, uh, and inside the Public Garden so many times that I know what this picture should look like, and I know what the average uh, standalone camera will do with this. And so it's it, it might be okay for a phone camera to screw up the color on, on the sky, let's say, Actually, it isn't. But let's say let's say it is because hey, even my two thousand dollar camera has screwed up that screwed that up on occasion. But it's not okay for it to not lock focus really quickly when you have a statue that's this huge and it's against a clear blue sky. There is no excuse for not getting the, the, that exposure uh, and that uh, and that uh, and that focus right. And there's some and because it's a dark uh, patinaed brown uh, brown bronze statue, some are going to be really good at figuring out how to not blow out the sky while still giving you the texture of the statue, some are not. Uh, there's, uh, there, as time went by though, it's really hard to get a phone camera that's not at least good. Seriously? Uh, that, uh, I, I think that's true. If you, if you spend the, the minimum amount of money for a decent phone, which is $250 for, let's say a, Moto, a Motorola G, I think, uh, I think it will be as good as an iPhone from let's say three or four uh, or five really? years ago, which was, which was excellent. So it's hard to get them to really screw up. Like there, uh, there's a shot of uh, if you ever. I, I really encourage people to visit the Boston Public Library if they have any beautiful free time building in Boston. Exactly. This was. I won't give you the three-hour <laughs> audio tour of what this building was like, but I want you to imagine uh, Boston in the late 1800s when industrialists start making an immense, crazy amount of money, and they every one of these people, both as individuals and as a community of Bostonians, wants to impress upon the world that not only do they have impeccable tastes, class, and culture, but they also have the money to buy an amazing demonstration of class and taste and culture. And that was the form of the Boston Public Library as it was built in 1888 and opened in 1893. But there's a, so that John Singer Sargent, yes, the John Singer Sargent, painted over the course of 30 years an immense mural sequence. Oh yeah, I've uh, seen it. On the, on the ceiling, right, of, of the third floor. And it uh, it's, gold leaf and it's paint and it's sometimes it's actually plaster bits and gems embedded into the thing uh, uh just and this is an incredible thing and i remember the first time that i took a picture of it with a phone and there's a section in uh, one of the one of the lunettes where uh for for lack of a better word it's like a representing a deep 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 black uh, black night sky with some stars in it and the first time i took a picture with a phone camera and it actually reproduced the, the stars instead of just I give up. It's just black uh, because remember that yeah, this is couldn't, not couldn't re yeah, resolve it. it. Right. It's, it's not lit by floodlights. It's not. It's just a ceiling that's way, way up in the air. It's, I mean, there's light around there, but it's not a good. And now pretty much every camera can do that. And now it's 
which of these cameras is, is going to be able to actually like get the texture of the paint in there as well. So nowadays, however, so mostly what I'm doing is just seeing, uh, I know that I'm pretty sure that the camera is going to figure out how to get this shot. Now I'm more or less trying to figure out how easy is it to use for me to get that shot, meaning that user uh, interface. Exactly. Like every time I, I wake it up, has it remembered the settings I had five minutes ago or did it reset and turn off HDR or right, right. turn on the flash or all, the, all this other sort of stuff? Uh, one test that I added as a joke, uh, when the, I think it was when the iPhone 5 might have been, uh, could have been the iPhone 4, uh, but one of uh, Apple's standard like press demo photos was an unnaturally close photo of a, of a Western squirrel in a tree that made was so close and so good. I thought, did they? When I had my, my media briefing in a hotel room with them, I said, "No, is that a live squirrel, or did you get one out?" Because uh, squirrels are generally very antsy. And so, just for fun, I thought when I was writing the review, that it would not be complete unless I tried to get a photo of a squirrel. And there are the, the public garden is a huge, beautiful public park with lots of trees. They can help you out if you want to find a squirrel. So there are squirrels there. Uh, and so I got, got that picture. And then I realized that this was a really good test of something that I had never been able to really test. I don't have like little kids. I don't even have a, like a, a little dog. So the problem of I need to get a picture of a small mammal uh, that is cute and attractive, but won't stand still. It won't pay attention to me when I say, look, just stand still and don't, or it starts running off in any direction. That is also a good definition of a squirrel. So that's so you, that is how I can that's how I can test out like are the are the are the uh, controls big enough that I can find that that whenever I want is the focusing fast enough that's where you find out things like uh, one f uh, consistent fault of the iPhone series is that the all all these phones have to figure out how do I deal with low light because we've got a right. we've got a a, 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 a a flake of rice sized sensor that that's not something that does well and. The iPhone's go-to solution is what it, whatever you do, don't reduce the ISO. Just whatever you do, don't Just reduce the ISO. keep the, the noise ISO. out, sacrifice elsewhere. Right. And one of the sacrifices is it doesn't, it really, really, really does not want to go to a high shutter speed, which is why even on a phone that costs a couple hundred dollars less than an iPhone 8, it will take a better picture of a squirrel than a uh, than the iPhone 8 does because simply because the what cheaper one of those cheaper Android phones has been told, Slow, uh, high shutter speeds are good. We don't we don't worry right. about. We will we'll deal with the noise later. If it's if it's if it's blurry, we can't possibly fix that with any algorithm. So make sure you use a, a, a fast enough shutter speed. Whereas the iPhone is going to use a longer shutter speed, so it's always just a little bit of blur, just enough to not enough that you would reject the photo, but enough that if you again happen to take the same picture with a Samsung phone uh, or a Motorola phone or an LG phone, you'd say, "Wow, why is this one on this cheap?" phone that you get in a blister pack at CVS, why does it look so much nicer than the really nice picture from I didn't the show you my notes, and one of my notes later is, explain why you shoot squirrels. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you post a lot of pictures of squirrels. Also, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring up the Holsteins. If you have not followed Andy on Instagram or on Flickr or anything like that, go, go follow him, because I love the Holstein shots. Explain the Holsteins to me. This is another one that could go for half hour. I'll try to be as brief as possible. So there's a, about uh, 2009, I think it was, I was going to, I needed to pack for a two week trip uh, speaking like in Japan and in China and in South Korea. And I'd never packed for such a complicated trip before. And because I, I also needed to like, bring network stuff because I was giving some like talks about uh, networking and technology. And so, uh, and also, again, trying to sustain myself for two weeks. And so I just kind of, after hour 43 of the packing process, my mind was a little bit numb. I had my big roll away that I bought specifically for this trip on the bed still. And saying, God, how many pairs of socks do I need? Like, oh, do I need to have a pair of dress socks? As opposed to high -week? And I, I'm, I look up, and at some point I look to a shelf in my bedroom and I see this, uh, tree, this trio of really, really beautiful little, like, hard rubber painted uh, cow toys they're they're just realistic mo like realistic models of, of cows are about they look uh, really good beautiful i think i think schleif or not Sch some there's it's a german company and they make every single animal you can imagine in this lineup i a, a couple of years earlier i was in a toy store in san francisco uh, and i saw them like a big case of all kinds of these ones and i just thought they were really beautiful little sculptures so i 
bought the, the, the mama cow and the daddy cow and the one of the little calves and I just had them as a decorative thing. And it, for some reason, as I'm packing, I think, should I take the, should I take the cows with me? And I'm almost literally having a conversation in my head about why would we want to take the cows with us? Well, we could take pictures of them in fun places. I've seen people do that before. Yeah, but they, that's kind of lame. Yeah, but what if we did it so it wasn't lame? So, it, and and finally, finally, a third person just like was sick and tired of hearing this argument and said, "Do we have room for these cows? Yes or no? Yes. Put them in the bag. Let's move on. We'll either use them or we won't use them." And then I found, and then I discovered later, as I'm going, if I'm taking my walk to the Forbidden City, it is it is a lot of fun to not just simply, "Hey, look, here's me with my hand holding up this cow toy," and you can see like I'm taking a picture of the cow in front of this thing. It's more like because these are so realistic. Like, can I pick? Can I put them in places so it looks like these are real cows visiting the Forbidden City? And, and then and it becomes. We should point out. Again, you need to see these pictures. I don't have one I can pull up, but your camera angles, this is actually to me where some of your photographic skill really so shows through, right? You understand uh, uh, you know, spatial, spatial relationships. So you're able to get angles on these cows that will make them look like they're standing in, in uh, Times Square and they belong there. It's... Yeah. <laughs> It's, it was, I'm glad the third voice chimed in is really what it comes down to. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's, well, it's spun off from there because when I got home, I, I liked the pictures and then you, you just have that realization that, well, once you have pictures of the cows in Beijing uh, and in Nagasaki and in, uh, in South Korea, that those are hard to get. It's easy to get them in San Francisco. It's easy to get pictures of them in Boston. You may as well keep doing this. And now it's it's I have a great deal of fun. And oftentimes they are they are actually responsible for me exploring a lot more than I used to. There was a I was in uh, Barcelona for uh, Mobile World Congress. There's this huge phone like mobile device uh, show, and I was really this is one of those hell trips for me where. I could only be there for about 72 hours and every single hour was spoken for with meetings and briefings and time time I needed to write things and post things. And so I'm packing my, my, my flight to London for the next thing I, I needed to do was I had to be out of the hotel by 4 a.m. I had not seen anything of Barcelona. And then uh, I just realized, <laughs> I think to myself, no, this is not appropriate. It's not okay for you to spend 72 hours in this wonderful city for the first time and not have any pictures that aren't going to be used with your columns and like what, what can i say it's, it's 10 30 10 30 p.m what can i see at 10 30 p.m and okay here's the, the sagrada familia the, the, the oh yeah uh, gaudi uh so which is going to be finished subway. finally in 2026 uh well that's what the contractors keep promising don't they uh but yeah <laughs> and so and so and so okay well the, the subway will take me there so okay so and it was literally because i had the cows with me because i usually travel with them like i'm not going to leave barcelona police at least one picture of the holsteins there and, the, and I got to see the Sagrada Familia chiefly because I wanted to get pictures of the cows in a Barcelona landmark. So. And it, it talk about beautiful. That that's mm. that's a crazy building. Now that kind of that kind of steers us into the combination of this. Your ah, tech steers you get it. and you know, steers. You see what I did sure. unintentionally. <laughs> uh, your tech and your photography world, right? Mobile photography is is completely changing these things. By the way, if you could pick one phone. If you could only from from a photography point of view, if you could only carry one phone as a your go to camera, what would it be? Ooh, that'd be really hard. It would probably be. And try not to color it that you're also a tech guru. What would what would you yeah. say you would pick versus what you'd suggest for a normal human? Okay, I I would pick the uh, the the Google Pixel. Uh, at least the, the two XL, which is out now, and the Pixel Three that comes out in a couple of months is, pro is certainly going to be even better. Uh, and that's because uh, their camera app is amazing. What, they, what they're doing with uh, HDR, you leave it on all the time, and it's so well trained. I can't do that on the so iPhone. Well executed. Yeah, I mean, they, it's it's you. It's the most natural HDR ever. They have such great post processing, uh, and every, you know that the secret to the iPhone, the secret to every premium phone, isn't the camera sensor, it's not right. the lens. It is the the image processor they've got in there. And uh, the iPhone does a wonderful job. The Pixel, however, I think just does a better job for me. Um, if I'm going to recommend to a third party, it would be harder to figure out whether to recommend an iPhone eight or the 
pixel again. What I love about the iPhone is that all the really fun apps for manipulating photos and exploring photos in a new way, they always come out for the iPhone first. And it's, it's, there's a long discussion to be had about are people ruining their photos by applying all these wacky Instagram filters and putting floral bouquets on people's heads. Uh, and that's a, that's a wonderful academic discussion. But the thing is, if you, whether they think, you think these uh, features and filters are tasteless or not, it gets people excited about photography and it gets people excited about taking pictures. That's never a bad thing. No, like, and, so, and, and apps on the iPhone, like focus, uh, that does amazing stuff. There, there's, there's a lot you can do with a phone, which is kind of why actually I, I wanted to have this, this kind of discussion. Two and a half years ago, maybe three years ago, uh, we were going to Italy uh, and we were going to take our son and I didn't want to be, you know, that dad that hold on, everybody, I need to get this shot. And I pull out the Canon 5D Mark IV with a 24 to, to 105 or something. And I had done that once before in Hawaii where the photography really mattered to me. And it was like, you know, this is Italy. I want to see Italy. I don't want to see it through a viewfinder. And my kid is with me and he's just graduated college. This is a family moment. And I'm with my wife. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to only take my, at the time, iPhone 6 with an Olo clip. And were there times that I really wished that I had had a full, real, quote unquote, camera? Oh, yeah. But I came back with pictures I was completely happy with. And then last year we did a France trip and I did the same thing. Now, there, I don't think it, I was success, as successful this time, but it really got me thinking, even point and shoots, sales on cameras everywhere in all areas and in, in all uh, uh, lines of, of manufacturing of cameras, sales are down. I'm wondering, are point and shoots as, as sales are diving down, are, are they going to go the way of a zip drive? I don't think so, because I think the industry has understood why uh, sales of proper cameras, so to speak, have been going down. They understand that you, you can't give people uh, a, a pocket camera that duplicates the functions of a phone, except for the ease with which you can share your pictures with everybody else. So Wi-Fi Connect is nice, but it's not as easy as just simply saying, post this to Instagram. Right. Uh, so, so as a result, though, a lot of really fine, fine cameras have been coming out. I... Uh, um, well, about two years ago, I think, uh, I bought a uh, Panasonic Lumix LX10 pocket camera. Uh, the, and the, this was the sort, it was about 600 bucks, so not cheap, but not, not super expensive either. And this was a classic, this is a classic camera that uh, the industry really wasn't interested in because they figured that if you wanted a camera with a good lens, wide aperture, uh, a, a good image sensor, good image processing, really well built uh, takes exceptionally good pictures, lots of manual modes and lots of customization. Well, that's when that's when you're going to be buying an inexpensive SLR, aren't you? So we're not going to bother making that. We're going to put all of our interest in making like cheaper cameras that just do essentially point and shoot sort of snapshots. And I really, really like it. The, re the reason why I got it is sort of a reason similar to why you took your your phone, because there are times when I really don't feel I don't feel like it justifies taking my real camera kit with all the lenses uh, and the right. straps and the, and the whatnots. Uh, however, I'm cognizant of the fact that I'm going to be spending four days in New York, and maybe I will have two hours in which I will want to simply walk around and look for good pictures. And so all the times where I would just leave the camera, either leave the camera kit behind and take pictures that are perfectly fine, but I'm aware, really well aware of what I'd be able to do with them had I been able to have, if I had a much better sensor in there, if I had uh, the ability to shoot raw, and I mean like real, real one raw. inch sensor. Right. Uh, and it's it's not heartbreaking, but I'm glad to have something to pocket. And it, almost just as bad as when I'm boarding the plane with. I almost I almost always wind up having to like wear my camera and board it, as opposed to finding room for it in my laptop bag and just dragging this thing around. At the times where I'm packing for, for, for my return flight, realizing that you didn't even take it anywhere. This, this was just an albatross around your neck. How, how, so. Is this the size of where you, it would have a wrist strap? I mean, you say you put it in your pocket, but I, I've met you. You wear 5'11 tactical pants that have pockets that you can fit a rabbit in. So is this, is this a camera that an average consumer could fit in, in you know, loose jean pockets or maybe a, a young lady in a purse? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, I mean, it's about... Um, I don't want to say it's a, it's the size of like a credit card or a hotel card, but only a little bit larger than this. And it's about maybe three quarters of an inch thick. 
Uh, and of course, the, the lens just uh, pancakes back into the into the body when you're done with it. It has a, a feature that I've loved about Panasonic Lumix uh, pocket cameras. It does have a pop-up flash, but oh, these clever, clever engineers. Uh, I, I hope that they did this intentionally, where they realized that now it has to. It has this little panta, pantogram on spring, so it pops up and leans forward, so you don't get red eye. But they also figured out that well, we could just like build into this little scissors configuration, like a little bump, so that to make sure that the there's no physical way that the flash cannot be pointing dead forward. But if we leave that out. We know that the flash is going to be pointing forward anyway, and it means that if somebody wants to put their index finger on that spring and bend it backward, that person can then bounce the flash off the ceiling in this tiny little pocket camera. Wait We're a minute, you're saying you this. can do bounce flash with a built-in flash? If you if you can if you can vamp for a second, the, the, my camera's in the other room. I can pick it up for you. And I, can I, you. I will I will do old dad jokes or something. <laughs> Here you go, drum, drum, drum solo from Steve. Yeah, drum solo from Steve. Here I go. I'll do some uh, some Zeppelin. You know what I should do? <laughs> I should I should have music queued up to play. That would be fantastic. So Andy will be back in just a second. He's going to grab this Lumix. So this is going to be interesting to see. Uh, and then we're going to get into innovation roadmap, some things that are coming out there. And then we're going to take a look at some of Andy's photos as well. Again, if you like Behind the Shot, we are now at BehindTheShot.tv. We're no longer at This Week in Photo. So make sure if you're going to subscribe, you go get the right links at BehindTheShot.tv. That way you can subscribe to the right feed, the new one, not the old one. And if you could leave us a review or something, that would be very, very much appreciated. And I actually just nailed the post. He's back. Look how that worked. I'm back. Okay, so this <clears throat> so is, you've got this, this is, thing. So I've got this. This is the LX1. Oh, wow, that's way smaller than I thought it would be. Yeah, so I mean, this is my... like this, you this could the, It's the size of a deck card. of cards. Right, roughly. This is, you see that this, here is the hotel card and it's barely larger than that hotel card uh and key card for a room sorry you have the key a key card and it's not thick at all again the only it would be nice if the lens collapsed completely into the body but oh well what can you no do? but the body's uh, what a body looks like it's about two fingers and the lens is maybe another finger if that yeah it's it's, it's not bad that this is this is the thing that's going to stop you from being able to pull it out of a pair of sort of tight jeans so but uh but else that also makes room for an actual like aperture ring on the side of it so you don't have to just have that as a function button or something like now that. now i get the a, one picture we're gonna look at you sent me one of the pictures you took with that camera i'm not gonna say what it is yet but i i was wondering how you got that shot with, with yeah. what i knew was a point and shoot that makes sense yeah oh, and it has a that. flip up and it can go completely 180 so if you want to take selfies with people <laughs> That, that's that's the other nice thing about this. Sometimes your your selfies are great with a phone, but they're even better with like a real. Again, a, I'm not using real camera as a disparagement. Right. But just I think you'll understand what I mean by real camera. Uh, shoots 4K. But here's uh, here's what I'm talking about. So you you flip up the flash like that. That's how it just deploys. You guys so again, are gonna nice. want if you're listening to the audio of this show, you're gonna want to go watch the video of this show. <laughs> yeah, so it's, so it just flips up and it's like now leaning a little bit forward. But you'll notice I'll look in like that. If you do, you can just like bend it like that. Oh, that all the is way vertical, wonderful. Or any way you want. I don't think it's even documented as a feature. It's just that and it's not. It, there's no like resistance. It doesn't feel like I'm about to break something. It's just that they decided that so long as so long as it doesn't move any more forward than uh, than we want it to, so that it will always be face when it's fully deployed regularly it'll face forward we don't care if someone tries to bend it backward so i, I really i want to believe that that was 100 percent intentional something inside yeah. me says it wasn't but i but i hope it was so maybe maybe they didn't the first time they put this on a camera but after i think they found enough people like me saying oh my god that's the nicest thing ever that's, that's a good feature I, that, that actually is very very useful feature i'm wondering from both the point and shoot and the mobile space when i say mobile i mean obviously mostly phones right yeah where where is that type of tech to you not necessarily what you wish but where do you think that's gonna head in the near future both for amateurs and pros because they've done they've done major uh commercials have been shot on iphones major fo fashion photo shoots there's photographers that wanted to do it you know i don't know if it was a joke or just something to try but there's been phone cameras that have been used in the pro space. So where do you see the tech in, in mobile going? 
really, it really, I think it's really going towards the cloud. It's really going towards artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, there's, uh, you, uh, you posted a link to me uh, to, for me to check out the, uh, the light camera that really the, the Frankenstein mirrors, camera, like, like the, 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 yeah, the camera that's about the size of almost like a paperback book and it has a million lenses on it, all different focal lengths and all different yeah. sort, of, sort of things. And that really shows you this is what somebody in 1998, if they were creating a, 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 a prop for a motion picture set in 2018 about what a camera would look like. They would figure, oh, it's going to have a million lenses on it. And it's going to have doohickeys sticking out of it. They couldn't predict that. Well, yes, we could do that, but if we're really making a uh, a truly pocketable camera, we don't necessarily need a big lens and a big sensor and multiple lenses. What we need is the ability. What what we're trying to get is the results or the effects of having a good prime lens or a zoom lens or lens with low light, and the ability to. Uh, simply take a picture and then either because you synced it to Google uh, Google Photos and it came back or simply something was done on device, the, 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 the actual light that hit the sensor is just instructions for the software to say, I want you to build me a fake photo with the following parameters. I want it to, there to be a sky right about here. Right. I want there to be two people standing here in front of green grass and trees. And uh, I will let you know that it's also uh, morning light uh, I'll give you the exact time of day. I'll also give you the ac exact location so you know like what the season would have been at that time. As a matter of fact, from that location, why don't you also uh, be able to recognize that that is, in fact, the Eiffel Tower behind them. Uh, and the ability to look at this, and then the, the software simply says, okay, I know that probably this person, if this is truly a human being, she, he or she does not have this rainbow speckles all over his or her forehead. I bet that's camera noise, but I know what human skin should look like, so I'm going to make it look like human skin. And I know that the Eiffel Tower is not just some blip on the landscape. It's probably kind of important, so I'm going to sharpen it. But I'm not going to sharpen it too much because then it will look fake. And I know the people, really, I can't get both the sky and the ground the same sort of exposure, but I know people like blue skies. All that sort of stuff, it'll be able to fake this stuff so well that you just don't care that it doesn't have that one inch sensor, it doesn't have that light field uh, <laughs> lens array. Uh, this, I, I, I wish the, the light company the best. I always love it when a company is rethinking what a camera should be or taking a whole new approach. But based, I, I've never had a chance to try one myself, but I've never seen a really positive review. Uh, it's, it's a it was very, well, very. Supposedly, they have a working prototype, but I haven't seen any shots from it. And I'm sure that if you've got nine lenses, there's some depth you're map talk, stuff. You talk about the, the new phone, not not the not the standalone camera, but the phone. The, the phone the, one, the, right? That has a circular purple. array of five yeah. or nine lenses, and I'm sure there's some depth map stuff that they'll be able to do with that. But you know, I, I go back to the fact that Apple used two lenses to do their depth map, and. You know when they're when they're you know doing for their rear camera, Google managed to do a lot of those portrait effects with one lens. Clearly, you know light is light, right? And we are we are handicapped by the fact that in low light you're going to overheat a sensor, you're going to have difficulty you know getting it. Really, the thing that's going to change it is the software, the ability to intelligently remove noise while not blurring edges of an eye, right? So yeah. to me, that's where where all of this is going to go, and I'm I'm fascinated to watch what this is going to do for the the pro space. I mean, in your industry, many newspapers went to uh, reporters carrying iPhones and doing their own pictures. Yes, but that was remember that's that's cheaping out. That's that's the result of them wanting to fire the entire photographic department, right? As opposed to recognizing that that news is mobile and that cameras have phone cameras have done a good job. But you're but you're right. I mean, I don't. I still, uh, I, I'm not familiar with photographers shooting fashion or shooting sports unless they were trying, specifically trying to uh, change things up for themselves. Sometimes if you use a different tool, it makes you rethink what you think is important about a picture. When you don't have every single resource, how do you solve problems? That's very, very interesting. And sometimes you get a sponsor who wants you to see, to demonstrate how good the new Samsung Galaxy X 14 is. Right. Uh, see, a Sports Illustrated fight photographer is gonna use it. Uh, do they that show you funny. how much, do they, show, but do they show you how much time that person spent in Photoshop afterwards? <laughs> I have this vision now of a guy <laughs> next to a UFC cage with a, with a Samsung. That would be good. Uh, 
You don't want to get blood and teeth on a $5,000 lens, I'm guessing. No, that's, yeah, you, you protect your gear, right? Mm-hmm. What do you think, do you use any on your phones? Do you ever use any of the attachable lenses? Like I use the Olo Clip overseas, the Moment looks good. Do you ever try those? I've tried them. I just couldn't get into the habit of using them. It's still something else to keep track of. It's still something else I have to decide to snap onto the lens. Uh, whereas particularly when I'm using a phone camera, I just love the immediacy of it. That right. because there aren't because there aren't like switches and levers and knobs and a million settings, it really just forces me to focus on uh, the composition, decide where the light is, decide where the photo is going to happen, and try to be there and ready when it does happen. Uh, and to be honest, uh, another thing is simply that digital zoom has gotten so much better oh, in yeah. the past three years that it used to. There, there, there are two things in cameras that I used to just not even consider. One was I, ISOs. One was digital zoom. And in both cases, it's uh, I've had to learn, relearn that no, 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 6400 ISO on this camera is perfect. It's not perfect, but it's perfectly salvageable, salvageable and it's better than the alternative uh, of not using 6400 ISO. And digital zoom uh, on on a on a phone, it's not just pre cropping. It is I really want the I really want there to be foreground and background. I really want them to be large. I, I want them. I don't want one to be uh, grossly smaller than the other. So I will step 20, ten feet back and use a digital zoom uh, to do that. And then it will won't simply blow up the pixels. It will say, "Oh, okay, I get it. He wants this to look like like he zoomed in." Right. So it, it's it won't fake being a higher resolution picture, but it will not look like like a Nintendo graphics. And so that's why I just haven't bothered to use it. When I first, and see, and for me, I have a very soft, bendable case on my phone, but I have to take it off to use the Olaclip, which is part of the reason I have the bendable case because yeah, I don't want to do the two-piece case and set the pieces around and lose one of them. But when I first got the iPhone 10, I was at a concert. I was shooting a festival and decided to test the digital zoom. So I'm standing behind the crowd and I took a one-time, two-time with the lens and then increments five-time and 10-time. And I was, now granted, I was it was daylight, mid afternoon, but it did shockingly, shockingly well. And you you gave me some photos. One of them actually was an iPhone Seven Plus. Uh, I want to talk about your photography. Uh, you normally shoot. You've got the Lumix, but a lot of times you shoot an Olympus, which is a Micro Four Thirds. Which one is it? Uh, yeah, this is uh, actually when I got the first one. I got the other one too. So this was, as a matter of fact, I was just out shooting like just an hour before before the show uh and so yeah this is the first generation uh omd em1 which was with the first professional grade camera that i have ever bought uh because it took me a while to decide honestly that uh i was (laughs) finally i had gotten rid of enough of my incompetence that some of the limitations of not being able to get the shots I weren't or I want were actually because I was shooting with a good pocket camera as opposed to a pro camera. So at that point, yes, uh, I, I didn't, I, I spent money on a pro camera, not even a terribly expensive one. And I've got the, uh, 80, the equivalent of the 8,300 millimeter F 2.8, uh, Olympus professional zoom on it, which is abs- I, It's almost never off this camera body. It's just such, I just love this lens. Why so did you choose micro four thirds? This was three years ago. I, I, I keep meaning to write about the experience of shopping for this camera because for at least a couple of years before then, I made the decision that it's finally time for me to buy a professional grade camera. I don't know whether it's going to be. Yeah, because you're shooting all the time. Yeah, well, it's, it's not just that. I mean, it really it's uh, one of my maxims for all kinds of buying tech is that don't spend money on an upgrade unless it will solve a problem for you or create a new opportunity for you. Uh, and in this case, it was, uh, I was, sh- I was, for instance, I was, uh, I, then as now, I was shooting a lot of uh, people in costume at Comic Cons, and I was so terribly aware of the limitations of the camera that I had been using, which was just absolutely wretched in low light. And this is in convention centers that really isn't design, aren't designed for portraiture, uh, and getting access to the. Uh, uh, so that was the limitation and getting access to the button, the features I want when I want them, you know, the program buttons I was missing out on. I was missing out having to fumble to make, uh, make uh, switches settings. And also just the thing where every time I'm outside and it starts raining, I have to quickly get a, get a bag around it, put it in my, just the simple fact that this is so weatherproof that the last thing I'm worried about is this getting rained on. I actually have to take a picture with my, with quick picture with my phone sheltering from the rain because I was taking pictures on a tripod and I was waiting for waiting for an exposure to a finish or whatever. And this thing is just absolutely just drenched, just dripping 
with wet and rain. And this is me just not even caring because I know by now that that's this water is not sealed. Care. Weather is, sealed. This is weatherproof, weatherproof and water sealed. Right. It was. See, this this really? is part of what went into the decision. Uh, at the last, I knew that uh, I knew that I was not going to eventually get uh, like a Canon or an Icon, uh, either APS or full frame, because I knew that I travel a lot. And even with the full uh, the APS sensor, I think my last my last digital camera before that was the D eighty Nikon D eighty. Okay, maybe. Nikon D eighty. Yeah. Uh, right. And just the, the 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 horror of having to pack this up and care and find places to pack it every time. I knew I knew I needed something compact, so I knew that at at the maximum I'd be getting a uh, interchangeable uh, compact system camera. And so it was between the uh, the Sony system, the Fuji system, and this. And what really tipped the scales uh, for me was as I kept studying it and kept evaluating it, realizing that this was Olympus's uh, first professional camera. This was their, uh, their the, the whole point of making the, OM, the uh, EM1 was to sort of get uh, like a, a wedding photographers and other pros to consider swapping out big, heavy camera systems for this system. And so this is them Scott proving Moore that they did. Do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and this, and so this, what the 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 impression that I got, which turned out to be one hundred percent true, is that this is them saying almost almost like we don't care if we make any money off of this. We are going to give we're going to make this the best professional camera that has ever been made. We're gonna, again, so we're going to make it all out of metal. We're going to make it uh, weatherproof. We're going to make it shockproof. We're going to make sure that there are a, an immense amount of clicky uh, manual controls. Uh, and a lot of programmable buttons so you can uh, set things up the way you want it to. We're going to make sure there's a library of really, really good lenses. We're not necessarily, we're pricing it kind of like a prosumer or high end amateur, but we really want this to look right. and behave like a pro camera because once again, we're trying to change hearts and minds it out looks, there. It looks, I mean, I'm looking through the web, but still, it, yeah. it, it looks rock solid, actually. It is. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you in on another secret. Uh, bef- this is another mm-hmm. thing that I love a lot. I love my. Uh, my black magic, my, my exactly. It's a. Uh, I don't have the mixed stuff. I keep saying black magic, but it's black rapid. That's it. Uh, and this is not the cheap twenty dollars Chinese one. This is like the good. <laughs> right. <laughs> we, yeah, they, that's they what are, I use too. They yeah. Are, they, are, they are ready to be sued if anything, if it breaks and destroys your equipment. That's why it costs like eighty or ninety dollars. Uh, and so uh, when I first got the idea of, oh, actually, if I attach the tripod mount to my nice long lens, I can actually hang the black rapid off of this. What I didn't understand was that. Uh, if I didn't set some, if I didn't set like the belt thing correctly, uh, oh, the no. camera might, might, well, no, 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 the, the <laughs> camera might, the, the lens release button could get bumped and then I'll hear a clatter, clatter, clatter because my body dropped off <laughs> the lens. Fortunately, protecting the, if I, if I want to lose either a $1,200 $1, body or a $3,000 lens, I'm glad that was the lens and just <laughs> snap it back on. Work absolutely perfectly, no damage whatsoever, and it fell onto like a New York City sidewalk. No, no dings, uh, dents. Nope, there's not a scratch on it. Wow. It's just, does that like have? Lovely... Does that have image stabilization in the body or the lenses? In the body, so it'll work with whatever you got, and it works extremely well. Uh, and the, I, I can't. This this really is one of the most satisfying consumer purchases of my life. But not only was it great right out of the box. And this, my first pictures taken with it, I went to a museum in Concord, Massachusetts, where you can see things like the actual lanterns that were hung in Old North Church to signal. Seriously? Uh, yes. A oh, I gotta go there. There was a, they only have, they only have one of them, but a, there, even in like the late 1700s, there was a collector who was really interested in Revolutionary War memorabilia, either because he was a collector or because he recognized the, the historic importance. So oh. he actually talked to the managers of the church ask can i guess like buy you a new lantern if you give me this old one that's been in the church for 20 years uh so yes you can actually see it but so i'm inside this so the these absolutely tack sharp pictures with this two x uh, actually five axis axis stabilization hand holding at like one tenth of a second uh 200 iso and it's just like so beautiful and so sharp i'm gonna have to uh, write one just, of these i think it's it's amazing, and it, the whole thing really is uh, so compact. Uh, when I sometimes when I shoot, uh, there are the people who have full frame cameras with the equivalent of this uh, again, three hundred millimeter zoom lens and the nice body, and it's just so much bigger. And they really have to they have to take this with intent to shoot things. Whereas I can break this down and put this inside my laptop bag and just take it because I think in the future. Uh, and there, there are times when if I 
uh, if I lose the fight uh, to say, well, what if I just, I'm not going to be in Boston for a day. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll take my phone. I can just like take my little like Panasonic pancake lens, which I used for. What like, is that, a second. 50? Uh, it's the equivalent actually of a 35 and it's okay. a 17 millimeter, but F 1.4. <clears throat> so it's a prime lens. But, you know, when you click this onto this, it doesn't even extend really past the, the, the hand handle. Grip. So it's the grip, not yeah. necessarily it's not necessarily pocketable, but it will disappear inside my laptop bag. Uh, so I'm just going to be happy with it. And the, and, but the other thing that makes it such a satisfying purchase is that over the years, it just keeps getting more features. They keep releasing firmware updates. It's been supplanted by the uh, Mark II, which has a higher resolution sensor and has it's faster and all, all the sort of stuff you expect. But anytime that it's possible for Olympus to software up a feature, they'll do it. Uh, like uh, it does... Uh, what again clever clever engineers because this thing has in-body image stabilization some engineer or some group of engineers inside olympus must have figured out that well let's think about this in the abstract it means that we can move the sensor so that you know it keeps it stays stable we can move it left right up down that also means that if the this camera is on a tripod we can move this thing up down left right so that it's actually co it's actually taking capturing pixels that are in between the other pixels that we would have taken with one frame and then we can mush these together and create a 40 megapixel image not by doing some fakery but because we essentially took <laughs> a set of pictures with so again so we can get the, capture the pixels between pixels and it only really works if you've got uh, obviously if you've got a uh, uh, if you've got it on a tripod, because right, it has right. to be absolutely stable. But here is a free feature that you get <laughs> two, two and a half years after you bought the thing, and that's not even the only feature that they've added. It's like a really actually useful feature. So, you, so I'm, you gave me some pictures with this camera. <clears throat> I want to bring up one of them, the roller derby one, because you shoot a lot of roller derby, which is something I honestly never thought <laughs> to go shoot. <laughs> I mean, I'm old enough that I grew up when roller derby was in its prime heyday right it was on television on a regular basis but i never even realized it was st still going on except uh uh the young lady from imore who just uh serenity caldwell, yeah. serenity caldwell uh does roller derby <clears throat> when you shoot roller derby you're using the olympus you just showed me i'm using the exact setup that, that camera and that lens so the shot i just brought it up and it's a it's a great shot of people out skating a ref with his hands up, somebody else down on their knees, people sitting on the back wall. The, the, I like the composition because you were smart enough to get an angle if, if you thought about it. I don't know that you did, I guess. That the person against the back wall holding a camera, their head isn't cut off by her shoulder. No, Nobody's really cut in half. Even the little face in between the ref and the person kneeling, you can see the whole face, right? The composition is there. You really get the idea that something's being called and the one girl is looking at him going, <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> when when you're shooting roller derby, what kind of settings are you using? Is this dark? It is dark. Um, you're inside a, like a, uh, uh, that's the, uh, that team uh, goes in a like municipal skating rink that obviously in the summer and winter, summer and spring months, they drain it, so it's just concrete, so they lay down a track there. And it's better than most hockey rinks, uh, community hockey rinks, but still pretty darn bad. Uh, and this was this was part of what I really enjoy about photography. You, you know that when you're doing anything creative, the first time you do it and you look at your results and they're all awful, and your first reaction is, I can't wait to do it again <laughs> yeah. and do it better. That's when you know that creatively you're really being tickled in the right directions. Uh, and so the settings for this, this is one of those uh, one of those sort of uh, shoots uh, over the past two or three years that taught me that don't be afraid of high ISOs. You're, you're terrified to go above 1600 and, you're, and anything above 3200 is an absolute no-go for you because you're still right. having you still have having flashbacks to the 10 years you spent with cameras that were barely okay at 1600 uh, and really there is no <laughs> when you start off with the problem of this is action happening in a really kind of dim area fast action when like people the one of the, well, one of the things i love about that particular picture for people who uh, can can see it is that she has long long red braids right and, with, detail, and the, with a lot of with detail 
And so they're, they're whipping around. And so only the very, very tip of the whip is a little bit motion blurred, but everything it's, it really, it really makes you uh, understand or remind yourself that the only thing that software cannot fix is blur. If it's, whether it's motion blur or whether it's out of focus, you have soft, you can fix everything else when you get back to the desktop, but that, so you're just going to have to really, you're just gonna have to experiment and find out that five, one five hundredth is the optimal low uh, low shutter speed for, for roller derby. If you have to maybe one three twentieth, but try to get it back up to one one five hundredth. And then when you realize that even with your lens wide open, uh, and even with uh, it, it, the only the only answer is to go all the way up to sixty four hundred. Right. And I <laughs> thank thank I don't make my living with that. It's not like I had to then show this to. <laughs> to a bridal, to, to a bride and a groom, saying, "Here's your grainy pictures from your wedding." It was you, you get to play, you get to experiment. I realized that no, I really like the pictures I'm getting. Uh, the grain is okay, and I can knock it down with, particularly with desktop software that is just amazing these days. Uh, so there's still some grain there, but it's not uh, taking over the image. Uh, that's when you just realize that you do what you got to do to get the results you want. And I'm not at the level of sports photography where I can where I can even come close to saying this this Olympus OM1 is not uh, OM1 is not doing the is not uh, is not living up to my, I, I'm, I've exceeded the limitations of this hardware and now I need to buy a full right. frame camera. Uh, it is still the performance of this camera still out, out, still still exceeds my performance as a photographer. So it'll still do me for at least another couple of years. See, and, and as a concert photographer, uh, I completely agree with you on on the noise thing. I tell people when I talk about concert photography, a sharp noisy shot is always preferred over a clean blurry shot <laughs> there really is it's not even a question i wrote a blog post for rick salmon uh on ignoring the noise because so many people zoom in in lightroom to 100 yeah. percent, and it's like nobody is going to walk up and do this to your you know photo it's not designed for that i just got hooked on my mic yeah. um <laughs> it, it, nobody's going to do that and if they do then that's not what you're designing for. Forget the noise, shoot and get the shot. So for me, I shoot wide open all the time. I'm at 2.8 if I've got it, F4 if, if that's the highest it goes. <clears throat> and then I look at my subject matter. And if I'm shooting a jazz musician sitting on a stool, I might do 200th to 50th. If I'm shooting a metal band swinging hair and flying sweat, I'm going to go 320th or better yet for me because I don't hold as still as I used to, maybe 500th. And then my ISO is just whatever it needs to be and that's kind of you sent me six shots and you said pick whichever one you want to to dive deep into and it's kind of why i picked this one because it it strikes me as what i call concert photography low light action photography that's really all it is it's low light action photography so when you're shooting like this do you know the exif data on this shot uh yeah i can probably pull it up for you because like you say the one of the things i noticed is first of all the depth of field is really nice right you can make out the faces on the wall in the background but they're soft her face looking at the ref is perfectly tack and and the pigtails are detailed with one little flip of blur i mean yeah. this is almost like shooting a drummer i can picture those pigtails as drumsticks right so I'm I'm curious. Do you do you have it? Uh, almost there. <laughs> no worries. These, the series is on my uh, Flickr, so I'm scrolling up here. That, that's one. Of the, that's why Flickr is such a great resource. Oftentimes, when I want to shoot something I've never shot before, I will look at a picture I really really like, and I can check out the EXIF data to get some hints as to what I'm going to need to do in order to get that shot. Which uh, is so a great tip, also in and of itself, and that is so many people shoot and they look at the shot and decide if they like it or they don't. But they don't yeah. revisit why it failed by looking at what their settings were, right? They'll look at it and go, yeah, I don't like that one. ISO was too low. But, but if you don't dive in and look at your EXIF data and say, oh, wait a minute. I accidentally yeah, I mean, bumped my camera up to 5.6 somehow, which I'm not saying I, I know anybody that's ever, <laughs> ever done that as the rapid strap rubbed across their hip. But it yeah. happens. You try you, you 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 try to avoid as many unforced errors <laughs> as yeah, yeah, you possibly exactly, can. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And sometimes and sometimes it's really really hard. Um, okay, here it is. So it's uh, thank you for telling me the EXIF version, the color space. How about the actual more interesting stuff? I wonder okay, if yeah, it's embedded was, in the image. I can probably pull it up from the image. 
Uh, maybe. I think I spit, I spit it out from Photoshop. I don't know what it got. I've got it right yeah, so here. Was... Let me open this, and I will just pull up a command I in preview. And what it shows is the dimensions. <laughs> yeah. It's been stripped. I think I, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think what I, I, I've been using, I think it might have been stripped by the, the last thing I do is, is wash it through uh, a little bit of noise reduction. I think it might have taken the exit off. Um, my, but I can, I can already tell you that uh, my usual settings are 6400 ISO, uh, F2.8 or F3.4. I try really hard to avoid absolutely bottoming out because there are times when I really wish that a face right behind my focus point was in a little bit better right, focus. Okay. And, al and also superstition about, oh, well, you know, you were, ever, since, you'll keep reading, you, ever since you were a kid, you read in popular photography that the extremes of a lens of settings are never the, never the optimum. So I should, that's something I should maybe play with a little bit more. Well, uh, it's so an, it's that, a nice shot. I mean, this is and, a, and this think, is a nice either, capture. Yeah, either 1 3 20th or 1 5 hundredth. And that's and here. This is where you're. I'm really, really telling myself that this is this is the difference between uh, the if I I bet it's one three twentieth because one five hundredth the end of that long long braid might have been a little bit sharper. And that's this is this is the result of shooting like a bunch of different events at a bunch of different settings and realizing that one two fiftieth. Okay, most of them will be sharp, but if you get someone falling, right. they're going to be blurring. Like, and how about one eight hundredth? Even better, but you can't see much of a difference between that one five hundred. There's, yeah, it's no, it's a challenge. It always happens to me if I'm shooting a show. It's inevitably the show that, for some reason, in my head, no, I can do this at two fiftieth. That yeah. I get, I still get some sharp shots, but the perfect jump shot that I'm in the perfect place and he's looking yeah. at me and he's in the air and he's doing the splits in the air and the guitar's not blocking his face. And that's the one that I just think I literally just missed a portfolio shot yeah. because I wanted to stay at 3,200. How stupid can I be? <laughs> that's, that's the one that really bites you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's and it also, hurts. it actually takes a piece of your soul and just rips it yeah. out. You had a choice. You said, "Yeah, you you had two choices, Andy. You could either have had a beautiful shot or an almost a beautiful shot." You said, "I think I'd rather have the almost." Beautiful. Yeah, exactly. So it's, let's it's, look at some other shots you shot with the yeah. OMD. The bluegrass one was also the OMD, um, yep. which I have up. Where is this taken? Uh, actually, not that far from my house. Uh, I moved recently to a more downtownish sort of area. And it's close enough to a park that if there's some sort of an event, like a street event happening, I can hear it through my open window and I can look at my, uh, look at my, uh, the window in my computer and decide this is a good place to take a break. I will, just as I did tonight, grab my camera, which is our, which lives with that lens attached and lives with the, the sling always attached. And I try to remember to always erase the, the card and always keep, keep an empty card and a full battery in it at all times. And I'll hang out and take pictures of the band. I took pictures of, uh, of the band tonight. Uh, and had, again, you always learn stuff. It's always a really, really fun time. Uh, the Another lesson in low light photography, because these events don't start like in the middle of the afternoon. They don't start until like they're, they're like on a Friday, like with, and they don't start until there's been enough time for people to get home from work and decide that they want to go to a street fair. Uh, and this little park, this there, I was lucky this time because they decided to set up uh, in the middle of that little park so I, they could actually get whatever amount of sunlight was there. Tonight's group decided to be the stand and underneath this arbor of, of, of pine trees. So there was just no light going on anywhere and I had to give up uh, an hour before I would have given up with, the, with these groups. Well, this this would have been a hard shot too. For those listening on audio, go go look at the picture. All these pictures are going to be on the blog post at BehindTheShot.tv. But, but the guy is playing a dobro and a dobro has a giant silver metal disc where you would normally see a guitar hole that would be a nightmare for specular highlights. And then also the side of the stand-up bass, same thing. And I'm just gonna tell you, as a music photographer, you grabbed the right moment because in music photography, it's all about the moment. You got the perfect moment with her mouth. She doesn't look awkward. She's clearly in motion. There's a moment happening and her eyes are open, looking in a nice direction, you know, ni nicely done. You've got another one. Is this the, the bride? Is this the same park? Uh, nope, nope, this is, uh, this is the public garden in Boston. This is very uh, street another, photography. I like this because you've got a, a woman in a wedding dress and still nobody can put their phone down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, she's sitting. See, I, I had to caption this when I posted it that, okay, I know that she's alone on a park bench with a bouquet next to her, checking a phone and looking a little bit worried. It's not because somebody stood her up. She was with her groom just like seconds ago. The groom got up to say hello to a friend. That's why that's she was sitting on the bench with the groom. And that's why. Yeah. But that's the uh, photojournalism so- part, though, right? Photojournalism is <laughs> about telling a story. Uh, or not not photojournalism, but more street photography is about telling that story. And this story for the viewer could be interpreted seven different ways, which is awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All, all photography is a lie. That's once you that's that's one of the basic concepts. When you learn it early, it will free you up forever because you don't have to say you don't have to say, well, I, I don't want to correct the exposure here because I got the exposure completely wrong. Or, gee, if I add a lot of sharpening to this, right. it'll look a lot better than it actually was. And well, yeah, she was under, there really wasn't any, like her, her skin was very, very dull looking because she was in this, under the shade of this tree. Well, that's, that's not your point to, to tell the truth. You're a photographer, you're, you're here to tell lies. You're here to tell a story, even if it's a real life story, but if part of your story involves she was in better lighting. If part of the story involves no, she, you didn't have to wait like seven minutes for her to stop picking her teeth with her fingernail for her to have that beatific uh, look, look on her face. No, she, she was a, she was wonderful the entire time. That's like I know uh, photographers yeah. who you know pride themselves on the fact. I mean, they will literally boast online. I don't crop. I never crop. Well, yeah, my response that. to that always is: Did you have more than one lens you could have picked from? Because as soon as you picked the seventy to two hundred over the thirty five, you just cropped. Yeah, I, you, see, you I, literally I, you chose what to exclude out of that frame instantly with your lens choice. Yeah, and also I don't know. Uh, everybody has their own point of view. Everyone has their own method. There is no wrong answer. My my own in my own personal bubble, I think I don't think I'm doing my job unless I me unless I can explain to people who are looking at this what I thought was interesting about this scene and what I want them to look at and pay close attention to. And that's one of the things you do with cropping when uh, right. it, it's so much. One of the there's uh, shooting a derby is fun if from the very start to the very ending. Uh, and part of the fun is uh, deciding that I this is a little bit cluttered, but I really want people to see that really amazing expression on that skater's face. And the way you do that is you crop and make sure that there is more empty space uh, to, uh, on that side of the person you want them to look at and less empty space on the side, or even you crop off, uh, not entirely, but the fact that you decided to uh, let people only see three quarters of the person on the, uh, uh, the on the right. That's not the person that is interesting. It's the person that seems to have two inches of, de- of dead air right. uh, on the left. That's a choice you're going to make. So if they, everyone should just post, uh, create the photos they want to create. But I don't understand a dogmatic idea that oh he cropped. That's too bad. Uh, I, I agree. I, I, would, I would love it if every shot that I took got all 16 megapixels of my sensor, but. Just as you were saying earlier, do you want a blurry picture that, <laughs> of, of the perfect moment or a sharp? It's like, do you want a slightly not quite as sharp picture of a uh, of an image that really tells a non-confusing story? Uh, or do you want to leave the viewer with the responsibility of figuring out what the story is? And well, they're, not, they're not looking at pictures to have their own little adventure. Right. They want to see the world through your eyes. And, and that's the whole point. People forget it's not just photography. It is photographic art. So you're making your art. Don't don't handicap yourself from from moment one. I've got one other one here with the Olympus, which is Tim Cook. Where was this? Um, this was at the education event in Chicago. Um, this this was another parameter as I was looking for a better camera because I go to a lot of press events, and I don't like to I don't you don't like to use the imagery that a company gives you. Uh, right. because it might not be useful for the story that you're trying to tell. And also because like this, the CEOs are identifiable and you like to have your own like unique picture of, of the CEO. And that's another, uh, it's another uh, sort of event where it can be very, very, and a very, very interesting set of problems because you might be really close up. You might be really far away. Uh, Apple is amazing. They really, <laughs> they are focused on every single detail and you don't have to, you don't have to, you, the only way you can screw up the color if you're taking pictures of Tim Cook on an Apple stage at an Apple produced event is if you don't trust the lighting that was already there. It is dialed in for cameras immensely and immediately. Uh, and so one of the things I wanted to be able to do is be able to take really good shots with the 
probably am not going to be in the front row. In this case, everything kind of came together where I happened to be like it was a, it was in a high school in a high school auditorium uh, or their high school theater. I was only like five or six rows back, uh, so I was able to take you know, shots or even like closer up than this. What lens was wanted. this? Do you know? Once again, it was that eighty to three hundred millimeter lens. I think it was that was that would have been probably this, at again. This is TAC. Yeah, I mean, I and, zoomed in on this when you sent it to me, and I don't the ones you sent aren't super high resolution, but. You you can through his glasses, his eyes are tack. Yeah, a beautiful yeah. job on this. I've got two more pictures I want to show, and I'm gonna start with the Brooklyn Bridge one, because the Brooklyn Bridge one is th this image is an iPhone seven shot, and I pulled this up and almost thought that you mislabeled it, <laughs> and you know why I'm saying that. Yeah. Look at the reflections that you managed to capture and hold. And if you look at those, you can actually see the lines of windows and stuff. This is a phone. And this yeah. is the point of the conversation. Mobile photography is, is on the scene. This is, this is serious now. Yeah, I was, uh, uh, I was uh, actually, I was in town for a Microsoft uh, press event, but I was still working on my iPhone 7 review. Uh, and so I decided that I've always wanted to try to get this shot. This is of uh, on the uh, the other side of on the Brooklyn side of the Brooklyn Bridge uh, morning. Like this was shot at like 7 a.m. during winter time. So and it happened to be a, a nice day. So I'm getting blue sky transitioning to purple, transitioning to like green pollution. <laughs> uh, the, the the skyline is being lit by still being lit by the the uh, uh, the sun. Uh, the East River Ferry happened to come in at the right moment. Yeah. I was. This is this is another one where you tr you really really want to underscore the fact that photography is a lie. I I wanted this shot. I knew what I had to do to get this shot. I knew what time I had to be there. I knew that I had to take the train that would get me <laughs> into New York City at two a.m. and find a, find place things to do for the next three and a half hours. Be there at six a.m. Have the my have the phone on a tripod. Uh, oh really? Bring, this was on a tripod. This was on a this was on a tripod. Uh, on uh, and as always, when it comes to trying to get sunrise or sunset, you think that the, the lighting is perfect for a whole twenty minutes, and then there's the moment where no, the lighting really is perfect, and then you'll get maybe two frames off before the lighting is, to is almost total garbage. Uh, and so this is this is why you if you really want the shot you do what you want to get and then there's some post processing but not a whole you lot. Use Lightroom, right? I use Lightroom, yeah. Okay, because and, and by the way, I, I I just thought about this. You've cropped this pano. Was this a pano shot or a normal shot that you cropped? No, this was one frame. Um, there's <laughs> uh, once again, if you if you don't crop a shot, this, this is such a horizontal composition. You see the you see the Brooklyn Bridge just stretching out from the uh, from the Manhattan side to the Brooklyn side, and if you include all the water underneath it and all the sky above it, you're just it's just not interesting. You're saying yes, please, dear viewer, take a look at this sky with nothing in it. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the image. It doesn't make it more pleasant. It doesn't lead your eye anywhere. But well, what the heck? I I took those pixels home with me, and darn it, you're going to look at them too. Well, and and I. Periodically, I end up judging image competitions, and I try explaining to some people when you when you think about your composition, it's not just what you see through your viewfinder, right? It's how you're cropping, and yeah. think of it from a cinematic point of view. Movie cinematographers were able in the days of four three television before widescreens to still tell a story, and they they managed through a normal four three crop to focus and compose and, and do what they needed. And now that you've got widescreen, there are times that that photograph needs breadth of space. And you can emphasize that by cutting off the top and bottom and staying within, like you say, the, in this particular case, the bridge comes from the upper left corner and it comes down straight through the rule of thirds. And, and it, it's a, it creates its own leading line with the ferry in the right spot to not interfere and, with your eye following that line. And, it's and like thank, you say, it's a lie heavens. because two seconds later, that ferry was yeah. in the wrong spot. And and thank heavens the ferry was going in the correct direction because if it had been facing the opposite way, oh. your eye is going from left to right. The boat is also going from left to right. Yeah, that would have been weird. From right to left, I would have had to say, 
I love the fact there's a fairy in the foreground, but I'm going to have to choose a frame without it because that just looks too cool. Yeah, that's a good point. So the last picture I've got is is the Public Garden Flowers. And this is the one that was taken with the Lumix LX10. And the color in this image is, first of all, the one we just looked at, you took with an iPhone 7. And I know people with DSLRs that are serious about photography that could not have captured that shot the way that you did, right? Either they they didn't understand the composition or the time of day or the color or whatever it is, and the gear didn't matter. It's the old thing when people say to you, your camera takes nice pictures. Well, the photographer takes the pictures by using skill and education and knowledge. You managed to get this shot with that little teeny Lumix LX10 and the yellow flowers, the red one in the middle, the perfect blue sky, the touch of, of a cloud in the upper left. Uh, if the cloud wasn't there, you would almost need to go into Photoshop and brush it in because that mm. that brings the depth in. But you also had the the foresight to know to get down below the flowers level and make it seem like the old I'm going to date myself now. The old TV show <laughs> Land of the Giants. Remember Land of the Giants? Uh, yep. <laughs> Mr. Fitzhugh. In, in syndication. Yes, <laughs> it is. Um, I, I could picture a guy climbing up right now with a safety pin as his grappling hook. Um, the way that you you compose this, and you did it with a point and shoot. Yeah, and this is a good example of why I'm. I, I, again, I had a when I was doing my public radio show at the Boston Public. At, there's a studio at the Boston Public Library, and usually I'm done by like two, and I'll usually take a nice three hour walk and decided to not take the real camera, but I really wanted to take at least the pocket camera. This is an example. I didn't know that they had just, once a year they plant fresh tulips everywhere, just yellow and red, and just beautiful flower beds. Didn't know that was happening like this time. Uh, and this is, I couldn't have gotten the shot with the phone or else. I could have, I could have gotten the shot, but it wouldn't have been like this. You would it have would lost have, the sky. These, uh, but I lost the sky. All the colors would have completely blown out. It wouldn't have gotten any data off of those intense reds and those intense yellows. Also, there's uh, also the ability to flip out that screen. And if I really want to get like a, a eight inches off the ground, I could have done it with the phone. I would have looked like more of a goober than I did <laughs> squatting with a, with that uh, with that Panasonic camera. But also, there's a little bit of a pop of flash because I wanted to soften the. Okay, the I was going to ask you where'd the highlight on the red one come from because. It's not on any of the, the leaves or stems. So I was wondering if that highlight on the red was ar artificial. I think I think I had a pop of flash there. I've, I'm, uh, sometimes when I look at these photos I've, took, I've taken, if I don't have the exit in front of me, I have to be forensic and say, I gotta put myself in the head of this. Andy it had to be, because you'd have it on that leaf think? right below it. Yeah, um, uh, but yeah, and the, and, the, and the other thing was, this is where uh, the, the, the work file of this, I actually called it the Leroy Jenkins edit because I knew that what I really liked about this when I was looking, uh, I, I forget that I was the photographer who took a picture because I, when, I, when I open this up in Lightroom or, or an editor, that's a whole new thing. So I, it's what I really responded to is I really liked the intense color. And so I wasn't getting it right, wasn't getting it right. And suddenly I just went, Leroy Jenkins. I said, guess what? Vibrance all the way up. Saturation all the uh, way Okay, up. there we go. Lumis I was wondering. All the way up. And because that, that's, It looks that's real, though. It doesn't look overcooked. It's, well, it's, it's, it's. it's I mean, it's got dramatic. a pop. It definitely has a bright pop. Yeah. But. But that it, look, it looks, I hope that it looks like a decision was made as opposed to someone didn't know what they were doing and they landed. That, that, yeah, definitely. That's it, which is okay. Anyway, you get the, anyway, you get an image that people like. That's good. But uh, it's, it's, it, it, it's there, there are a lot of little lessons and little tips that I've built for myself over the past, particularly the past five or six years. And sometimes one of the, in editing, if I don't know, if I'm not getting it, then what I will do is simply say, let's set it up completely wrong and then take it back and see where, where it comes right. There have been times, like when I'm doing the uh, edits on the roller derby pictures, so many times where I'll think that I'll, I'll spend like an hour or two uh, taking a first pass through 120 pictures that I think are probably gonna be part of the final album. Like, great, that's, that's, that's nice. Then the next day, like, oh, I know I worked hard editing these, but there's just something quite not right. And then I'll say, okay, guess what? We're gonna really amp up the contrast to a stupid degree. We're gonna uh, change these channels to a stupid degree. And then I'm shocked that, wow, that was a, that was a really stupid move, increase the contrast, 
but it actually looks so much better with, with my, by, by, re, by repressing every instinct to be subtle on this particular image, it actually works. But and yeah, sometimes is, by overgoing, by going w clearly beyond, it kind of lets you know at least if you're in the right direction and then you just dial it down a little bit. But if you try and yeah. stay too low, you never get as high out of that fear of, of where it's really going to be good. Yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, realism, schmealism, it's like, well, and then there's, I, there's I, that. I would, exactly. There, there, there are times like with this flower picture for me, it was, I don't care about subtle colors. I don't care about subtle transitions. I want this not to be yellow, but freaking yellow. I don't want this to be red. I want this to be damn red. And I want this to be gall darn heroically green uh, against a blue sky that is almost an assault on the, on the, on the cones of your of your uh, of your photoreceptors in your eyes uh, I, I like i really like this so much that i this is uh, i'm trying to figure i'm trying to figure out what uh, a really good photo print service would be uh, to print this and hang this on my wall well i can tell you two of them actually but Please. uh but mpix that would look really killer mpix does a really nice uh job on their metallic paper that would look really good on metallic. And here's an interesting thing that kind of brings it full circle. And that is you wanted that, you know, insane yellow and the insane blue. Well, people don't generally, when, when they're looking at hanging a family photos, yes. But when they're looking at hanging art on their walls, they're not looking at hanging realism. They're looking at hanging art. And what you did with almost all of these shots, but specifically that, that flower shot, is you took it to a point of being art that I could see. I've said this on this show a bunch of times. I always judge whether something would look good as a really good print by if I can picture walking into a law firm, walking up to the reception desk, and could I see that as a giant print behind the receptionist? And that's really, to me, what this is. You could print this large. This would also look really good on acrylic. Hmm. Would look really, really neat. Uh, I really like your photography, people don't know about your photography enough, not to mention your, your journalism stuff. I've taken up a ton of your time, dude. Uh, <laughs> I can't say thank you enough. No, nope. well, again, I, I hope that it came across that I've been enjoying talking about, like not my photography, but it's, it's fun when you're talking to people that share a certain love so that you don't sound silly when you say things like, well, all photography is supposed to be a lie. I yeah. want to be, I'm telling you the truth with a picture. I'm not really doing my job as a photographer, am I? Yeah. It's <laughs> interesting. Go on about this needing to lie to people thing. Yeah, but, it, you know, it's true, though. And, and really, it's part of the reason we talked in the green room ahead of time. It's part of the reason I like this show is I want people not to just hear about a person's life and what made them pick up a camera. Right. I want them to see some photography. Yeah. That, that's and, not useful. That's not useful to me as someone who wants to be better. Right. It doesn't it doesn't take you to the next level. But it's, it's really hard to pick something out of a photographer's brain and have them have them just say, well, I do this. Looking at that photograph, looking at that flower or the roller derby and and hearing the choices that you made will help people make better choices in their photography to take them to the next level. That's the beauty of it. Yeah, it really is. I, I've, I get so much out of this hobby uh, because, as I said before, you know that creatively something is working for you when you create something you don't like. And instead of getting discouraged, it actually energizes you because every mistake you make is a mistake you're not going to make in a future image. And I, again, I, I say, I say, hopefully without ego, that I do like that flower image, but I could see how I would have messed, or excuse me, how I would have not served the subject as well five years ago by not understanding that you really need to get really low on this thing. And you can't right. have anything distract. It has to, there can't be anything between those flowers in the foreground and the sky. So you really need to get low and you need to make sure that you're not going to blow out the colors and you're going to, and it's okay to go really, really loud with the colors and editing a lot. Of, and that is all the all the photos you don't see in my Instagram and my Flickr. Those are the mistakes that I made that let me create the images that I like enough to share on my Flickr and on my Instagram. So if people do want to follow you, uh, your website, is anotco.com yes spell your name so that they know <laughs> i h n is in nancy a t is in tom k o okay and then you're the same thing on all social media right 
Uh, all social media except for Flickr because I joined Flickr before. I, I used to I used to try to like long, I used to try to be Andy I everywhere A N D Y I, uh, and I realized that now unless you're actually part of the programming team that works on this new social service, you're not going to get it. Uh, and so I'm still Andy I on Flickr A N D Y I. Uh, and I've actually, after kind of letting it lie fallow for a little while, while it was being ignored by Yahoo, now that uh, now that now that its new owners are right. putting more life interest into it, Smug it's sort of like Smug Thank you. Uh, it's uh, it's I now have a different hierarchy now. Where Instagram is for like more casual pictures, meaning maybe there will be some editing, maybe there will be like some some care and love put into it, but. When I then, then three or four days later, when I look at the Insta the, the version I put on Instagram and realize that, ooh, there's a bit of a cyan cast on that one. I'd really like to fix it. Do I really right. think? Don't can I crop that a little bit more? So Flickr tends to be like the canonical. Here is the here is the version that I wish I had posted to Instagram three or four days earlier. The and creative the, outlet. The, yeah, and, and and part of the reason why I love Flickr is that you, you can write paragraphs uh, in the captions because right. sometimes you really want to tell a story about it or have a discussion about well, it. Well, and you're a and writer, was, so of course, and, yeah, a, so. and a damn good one, my friend. So thank you. With that said, Andy, I on Flickr, and not co on all the the general social media: Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. <laughs> follow him on Twitter, by the way. Part of the reason I follow Andy on Twitter is again he's got. And it's that writer thing, I think, going on. He's got this kind of cool wit that I, I think you'll like. Uh, and then anotco.com, check out the podcast. Again, my favorite prod- podcast probably on earth. I'm not going to say more than mine, but yeah, it probably is. <laughs> Mac Break Weekly, check it out because all the people that are on it are really, really good. Uh, and Andy, thank you again so, so very much for for uh, for being on the show. I was really looking forward to this, and you didn't disappoint. I had a really great time. That makes me feel good. That makes me feel very happy. And I hope that I see you again sometime when you're in Southern California. Please. So, everybody, that is it for this episode of Behind the Shot. Normally on this show, we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. And, yes, we will do that again. But I just wanted to kind of delve into the mobile photography thing. I hope that you enjoyed it again. You can find the show at BehindTheShot.tv. And your best bet if you're going to subscribe to either of the podcast feeds, be aware we've got a video and an audio feed now. You can take your pick. You can do that through the website, BehindTheShot.tv. That's your best bet because if you just search through iTunes or something, you will need to be careful not to get the old feed because then you won't get any shows. There's no new ones popping up. Until next time, I'm your host, Steve Brazel. Thanks again so much for joining me. We'll talk to you soon. 